Julius Evola, Heathen Imperialism, First Part, We, Anti-Europeans, Second Chapter, The New Symbol. Are liberation and renewal still possible in this crepuscular world? Is Europe capable today of the level of awareness necessary for such a task? Let us not be mistaken, it is only after having understood the magnitude of the task that we will be able to act. The threatening reality of a destructive spiritual process, whose roots originate almost in the ground of prehistory, whose culminating phases coincide with those which contemporary men exalt as their essential civilizational values, and whose influences now manifest themselves in all fields of thought and action, must be acknowledged. This is not a matter of compromises or adaptations. The power of a new Middle Ages is needed, a revolt, interior as well as exterior, of a barbaric purity. Philosophy, culture, everyday politics, nothing of all this. It is not a matter of turning to the other side of this bed of agony. It is a matter of finally waking up, and getting up. There are still, here and there, men in whom live memories of an ancient nobility, who as individuals are ill at ease and feel the need to react, sometimes in this cultural domain, sometimes in that. Before it is too late, what must be recalled to the consciousness of these scattered men are the heights, beyond all the limits and private interests which currently exhaust their strength. Implacable action must ensure that their purest strength emerges, indomitable, ready to shatter the filthy incrustation of rhetoric, sentimentalism, moralism, and hypocritical religiosity with which the West has covered and humanized everything. The one who enters the temple, however much of a barbarian he may be, has the unquestionable duty to drive out as corruptors all those who in civilized Europe have succeeded in monopolizing spirit, good and evil, science, and the divine, and have exploited their monopoly by declaring themselves to be their propagators, while, in truth, they only know matter and what words, fear, and superstition have layered over matter. To all this must be said, enough, so that some men at least can recover the long roads, the long danger, the long gaze, and the long silence, so that the wind of the open sea can blow again, the wind of the Nordic primordial tradition, to reawaken the sleepers of the West. Anti-philosophy, anti-humanitarianism, anti-literature, anti-religion, this is the premise. Enough. That is what must be said to aestheticisms and idealisms, enough. To the thirst of the soul which creates for itself a Semitic God to adore and implore, enough of the need which binds beggarly men in mutual dependence in the name of the consistency which each of them lacks. We must pass beyond and above all this, with pure forces, which, then, will have to meet a task which transcends politics, which transcends the social prejudice, which must ignore the clamorous gesture and the superficial resonancy, and which is such that the materialistic force which vibrates on things and people no longer serves a goal. In silence, through a hard discipline, a self-possession and a self-overcoming, we must create with a tenacious and eager effort of individuals an elite, in which the solar sapience lives again, this virtus which is inexpressible, which rises from the depths of the senses and of the soul and which does not express itself by arguments and books but by creative acts. We must reawaken to a renewed, spiritualized and austere sensation of the world, not as a philosophic concept, but as something which vibrates in our own blood, to the sensation of the world as power, to the sensation of the world as rhythm, to the sensation of the world as a sacrificial act. This sensation will create strong, hard, active, solar, Mediterranean beings, beings made up of force and force alone, open to this sense of freedom and greatness, to this cosmic breathing of which the dead have stammered much but perceived little. Against profane, democratic and material science, always relative and conditioned, slave to incomprehensible phenomena and laws, deaf to the most profound reality of man, we must reawaken, in this elite, the sacred, inner, secret and creative science, the science of self-fulfillment and self-dignification, the science which leads to the occult forces which govern our organism and joins together with the invisible roots of race and things themselves, and which creates domination over these forces, so that, not as a myth, but as the most positive of reality, realities, men are born again, as beings who no longer belong to life, but, now, to what is more than life, and are capable of transcendent actions. Then there will be leaders, a race of leaders. Invisible leaders who do not speak and do not show themselves, but whose action does not experience resistance and who can do everything. Then, a center will exist in the West, in the West without center. It is a total mistake to think that we can achieve renewal if a hierarchy is not re-established, that is to say, if we do not place a higher law, a superior order, which can find confirmation only in the living reality of the leaders, above inferior forms, linked to earth and matter, to man and human. 
It is also an absolute mistake to believe that the state can be anything other than a civitas diaboli if it does not resurrect itself as imperium, and it is also a mistake to want to build the imperium on the basis of economic, military, industrial or even intellectual or nationalist factors. The imperium, according to the primordial conception rooted in tradition, is something transcendent, and it can only be attained by those who have the power to transcend the lives of petty men and their appetites, their sentimentalisms, their national prides, their values, and their gods. This the ancients understood, when, at the peak of their hierarchy, they venerated beings in whom the royal nature combined with the sacral, in whom temporal power was permeated with the spiritual authority of natures no longer human, bearers of a secret and invincible force of victory and of fortune, when a sort of sacred war lived in any war, something universal, something overwhelming, which addressed and organized everything with the purity and inevitability of the great of forces of nature. Will those who still can or still want to put up a resistance understand this? Will they understand that there is no other alternative? That there is no other spirit which, be it in other forms and in other figures, must be reawakened? That this is the only condition through which their revolution can be anything more than a trivial contingent event in a single nation, can become a universal concept, a first ray of light in the thick fog of the Dark Age, of the Western Kali Yuga, and the principle of the true restoration, of the only possible recovery?